Thank you for listening in again. Um, this time we're going to talk about what the Ark is, and to understand we have to go back in time yet again. So do you remember the tree in Eden representing God's authority as a lawmaker? Now who's a lawmaker? In earlier days it was the king. If you have no law, you have no authority to reign. Did you know that? If the laws of my country was removed, so would it be with the state's right to judge. Government would have no power without laws. Who cares what the Prime Minister says, or the President, or the King for that matter? If there is no national law, there simply isn't anyone to answer to. Calling yourself a King or a leader would be an empty scam. You would only be it in name only, and not for real. So the tree in Eden was symbolic of who the King was, who they would have to answer to in case of a crime. But they never knew sin. They didn't know what stealing, lying, or killing was. They didn't know what it was like to worship other gods. Because in the garden there were no sinful thoughts in the mind of men. So their loyalty was shown in a harmless symbol that was a beautiful piece of nature. The rejection of obedience to the Creator Father and worshipping one's own needs. The combination of these two are the start of the path that leads to all sin. Which is why Eva, rejecting God's command and exploring her own lust, was the start of sin. When each individual starts this path, there is no limit as to where it can end. So these two combined is the secret of the birth of sin in the world and in each individual man. So this is why what started by the tree ended up with the world in sin. But now men knew sin, the secret of sin was out, a secret that remained while the tree stood untouched in Eden. But now it was out and God could define it. He couldn't just as well tell Adam and Eve, thou shalt not kill, because then he would just have put the idea of murder into their heads. You know, it's like it is with a child, if you tell him not to do something he hadn't even thought of yet. You have planted the idea into the child's head and he's more likely to do it now than before you told of it. If God had defined sin to Adam and Eve, he himself would have put the idea of sin into their heads. But remember the law, the definition of sin was already written in the sanctuary in heaven. We know this because it already existed when they were building the replica of the sanctuary on earth. But the heavenly sanctuary was unrevealed because it wasn't relevant. So the tree in Eden defined sin without revealing sinful nature. The tree is a match with the Ten Commandments. One is hiding the knowledge of good and evil, the other define it. The tree was forbidden to touch and eat from so it could prevent sinful nature to be known and the law defined sin. In the first book in the Bible we learn that Adam and Eve was refused the right to eat from the tree of life because they had eaten from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were cast out of the garden and cherubs were, was guarding the entrance. In the last book in the Bible we are told, Blessed are they that do the commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter into through the gates into the city. So the Ten Commandments is here the new tree of knowledge of good and evil that we can't eat from if we want access to the tree of life. Now we have this today as well. If a king owns land away from where his home is, he leaves his seal and his law on that place. Then a group of judges and people are elected and make sure the law is respected by the inhabitants. So even though the king isn't present, they are reminded who they are to be loyal towards. God did not copy the ways of man, but this way of government is inspired by God, according to Romans 13, 1-2. Now, God's home and seat of regency is in heaven, but he left the tree in Eden as a seal of who the planet's creature owned loyalty to. And after the flood, this tree was no longer present on earth. So when God met with Israel on Mount Sinai, he told them to build him a home away from home, on his property, the earth. He didn't choose Israel to be his only people to reign. No, his plan was greater and worldwide. He said, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, 
for all the earth is mine. And from Exodus, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They were elected to represent him to the world. He says about the building of the Ark of the Covenant, And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the Ark, and in the Ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the Ark of the Testimony, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. This does not mean he was no longer king in heaven, it only means he claims to be the supreme judge on earth. The Ark of the Testimony became a symbol of who it is that judges man and who the world owns their loyalty to, and he set a people aside to take care of it, a people of priesthood or protectors. So between the cherubims of the Ark, God would reign over his people. Now this is important. Why would God reign from the ark? We have gone back to what we just talked about. Without a law there is no authority. So to be able to reign and to be able to call himself a king, he has to have a law that seals his kingship, just like the tree. In the law that was underneath where he would appear was four commandments telling about man's responsibility to him as their king. The six other laws explained how we were to treat each other. The fourth commandment, and for some it's the third, uh, because people have changed God's law later, but in the original law, as it is written in Exodus chapter 20, uh, this is the fourth commandment. And in this commandment, he gives the reason for his right to reign over us. It says that he is the creator of the heaven and the earth, and because he is the creator, we must keep this day, the Sabbath day, as a memorial of his kingship. Now the fourth commandment contains God's name, the area of his reign, and his title. You see this today as well, because the information is needed. All nations put it on their money and their seals. The king's or leader's title and his area of reign. Simply to show people whose law they have to keep in the country they are in. So God does this. His seal, he places his seal on the law and asks Moses to build an ark, a place for him to dwell. The law and his seal is then placed within it. The law is the base of his dwelling place. Maybe you can begin to see what a big deal this ark really was. Now notice, the law doesn't say, I'm the creator of Israel. No, in the seal, it says that he is the creator of the earth, nothing less. The tables of the law and the ark is therefore relevant to everyone on the planet. The claim he is making involves all of us, not just a few elect. Through this law, he claims to be the supreme judge of the entire planet. He says, for all the earth is mine. So when the seal says, heaven and earth, sea and all that is in them, then the rest of the law concerns the inhabitants of the entire earth. In Revelation chapter 14, the last book in the Bible, we see the message being given to all of the world, to all nations, tongues and people, to worship the Creator. So God's message of obedience go out to everyone and not just one nation. So what is the ark actually? The ark is several things. The first thing we learn about it is that the ark is a symbol of a kingship, meaning that the ark is the earthly throne of God. Does that mean that the ark belongs to Israel? No. It belonged to the Creator and it was placed amidst the children of Israel because he wanted them to be a kingship of priests and a elected people with a specific task. Now, do you remember the cherubim that rebelled against God, also known as the devil, Satan, or Lucifer? Notice how the ark has two cherubims and how God were to meet with Moses between these two. The ark was built after the pattern of the originals in heaven. The opponents were once very close to God, meaning that everything that Moses was asked to build was things the opponent knew of very well.
Many skeptics think the Ark was a replica of thrones from Egypt and other nations at that time. They claim its similarity in appearance show that the Israelite Ark weren't an original and that they were just copying the nations around them. But just as pharaohs claimed kingship with the serpent on their crowns, and so their servant master knew of the heavenly things and could copy them. So there is no wonder that many of the earthly thrones were built in a similar fashion. Here is an example of a throne with two cherubim on each side, and here is another from Egypt, and here is a Hellenistic one. So let's make a list. The ark was made after the pattern of the heavenly things. The ark was where God would be on his throne. The foundation for God's kingship is his law, and his law states that his kingship is the entire planet and not just Israel. The task that was given to Israel was to represent him in a special way, but his kingship involved all the nations in the entire earth. Now God exercises his right as a judge of other nations than Israel when he destroys the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, when he judges the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Egyptians and the Babylonians. If his only place of reign was the Israeli nation, he would not be allowed to judge and punish these other nations. He would be a criminal to flood the earth in the days of Noah. And Bible critics and those that hate the biblical God claim they do so because they believe he had no right to judge these nations. And this because they refuse God's claim as a king of the earth. Israel was once used by the Creator to punish ungodly and wicked nations. The fact that they did this proves that they at one time were especially chosen, chosen to carry out God's judgments on earth. And they could only do this because they carried the seal and law of God. Like a court today would represent the law of the nation when judging. By possessing God's law they were to execute judgment on behalf of the Creator. However, when Israel themselves failed to be true to God, he could no longer protect them, bless them or give them victory over other ungodly nations. To compare, it would be as if the police and judges upholding our nation's law would become corrupted and criminal themselves at the same time as judging us. Even if the Israelites brought the Ark of the Lord with them to war, they could not gain victory because they had made themselves enemies of God's state. And we'll talk more about this in a later episode. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 24, it says that God will one day judge all the inhabitants of the earth for having, having broken his laws. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly emptied, and utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken this word, the earth is also defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Some say God of the ark was unfair to destroy some of these old nations. However, calling it a crime is disputing God's kingship over the planet. God said, I have made the earth, the man and the beast that are upon the ground, by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it unto whom it seemed meet unto me. So the ark then has strong similarities to the tree in Eden, representing God's authority on earth, while he himself has his th home and main throne in heaven. Understanding what the ark is should awaken everyone on this planet, no matter what background, to listen to the one who claims that we owe him obedience. And it should also make us understand that a discovery of this ark would affect every human being, every nation, and not just Israel. If the claims made in the law in the Ark is correct, and its origin is from who it claims to be, then this item isn't Israel's most 
sacred artifact. It is the world's most sacred artifact, because the one whose law it is claims to have the right to judge you, no matter who you are. Now, Yeshua gave us a parable about a group of men that were set to guard a vineyard, and he says in Matthew 21, uh, verse 33 to 41, Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard, and he hedged it round about, and dug a wine press in it, and built a tower, and let, let it out to husbandmen, and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen, that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants, and beat one, and killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent another servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all he sent unto them his son, saying, They will reverse my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, and cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto these husbandmen? They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. So this leads us to ask what the Ark of the Lord looked like. Understanding what it looked like is important to determine if a discovery is fake or not. And when we study this very subject, we will surprisingly get a hint of the destiny of the Lord of the Ark. So make sure to come back for episode 3 I Have No Authority to Reign. Did you know that? If the laws of my country was removed, so would it be with the state's right to judge. Government would have no power without laws. Who cares what the prime minister says, or the president, or the king for that matter? If there is no national law, there simply isn't anyone to answer to. Calling yourself a king or a leader would be an empty scam. You would only be it in name only and not for real. So the tree in Eden was symbolic of now man knew sin, the secret of sin was out, a secret that remained while the tree stood untouched in Eden. But now it was out and God could define it. He couldn't just as well tell Adam and Eve thou shalt not kill, because then he would just have put the idea of murder into their heads. You know, it's like it is with a child, if you tell him not to do something he hadn't even thought of yet. You have planted the idea into the child's head, and he's more likely to do it now than... You know, these two are the start of the path that leads to all sin. Which is why Eva rejecting God's command and exploring her own lust was the start of sin. When each individual starts this path, there is no limit as to where it can end. So these two combined is the secret of the birth of sin in the world and in each individual man. So this is why what started by the tree ended up with the world in sin. But who the king was, who they would have to answer to in case of a crime. But they never knew sin. They didn't know what stealing, lying or killing was. They didn't know what it was like to worship other gods. Because in the garden there were no sinful thoughts in the mind of men. So their loyalty was shown in a harmless symbol that was a beautiful piece of nature. The rejection of obedience to the Creator Father and worshipping one's own needs, the combination Thank you for listening in again. Um, this time we're going to talk about what the Ark is, and to understand we have to go back in time yet again. So do you remember the tree in Eden representing God's authority as a lawmaker? Now who's a lawmaker? In earlier days it was the king. If you have no law 